Would you say that, that although God didn't design living things, that make, he designed the laws of physics in the first place, or that something like that? I would say, first of all, in very general terms, for my religious faith and my scientific knowledge, God works through evolution. God not only is the source of all being, that is, I don't know if we want to get into a discussion of what it means that God created the universe, but I believe that God created the universe, okay? But not that was not a moment, just a moment in time. God is continuously creating the universe, and he's working with the universe as we know the universe scientifically. If I'm faithful to what I know as a scientist, I reflect back upon the God I believe in, and I said, this God is marvelous. He created a universe that shares in his own dynamism and creativity through the evolutionary process. That is, he's not dominating the universe. He's not an autocrat. He's not a watchmaker. He's none of this. He's a God who created a universe he loves and gave to that universe a creativity and a dynamism of its own. But if it's sort of running itself and evolution's running itself, doesn't that leave God with rather little to do? And might you, mightn't he not be... Um, as it were, disappearing altogether if you, if you don't let him interfere in the way that you don't. Oh, I won't let him interfere. I don't think God <laughs> would want to interfere, even if we invited him to, but God sustains everything that's happening in existence. And now this is philosophy. This is not science, I admit it, you know. But from philosophical considerations uh, of, of reasoning human being, some of us reason one way, some of another would say that everything I know in the universe is contingent. That is, that it doesn't have to exist. In fact, I know it exists for a while and then it goes out of existence. And I reason like Aristotle did and St. Thomas Aquinas. If there's something that moves, someone had to move it. Well, if someone moved it, someone had to move them to move it. And I can go all the way back. Well, it would be irrational to say there's not a prime mover. I mean, there has to be someone who started this process. So with existence and with motion and everything else, philosophically considering it, there has to be a necessary being. Now, mind you, I'm reasoning to what I call the God of the philosophers. Now, that happens to be, I think, the God of faith also. But it's not adequate. The God of the philosophers is not adequate to me because it's not a God who loves. It's a God who explains certain things that I, I notice about creation, its contingency and all. Prime mover is a fairly, I mean, it's almost like just the first domino to fall and then er everything else. That that's doesn't correct. sound like a very godlike attribute. But it's, that's what I just said. That's why it's not the God. Not, the not philosophical God is not satisfying at all. It's the God who revealed himself, as we were saying before in Scripture, the God who got angry, the God who loved, the God who said to the people of, of ancient Israel, you know, you turn against me, you rebel against me, and yet I love you and I will continue to love you uh, through all the, the, the ages, through Abraham and the prophets and all. Um, that's the God of religious faith. There are people in your own field of cosmology who will say something like the fundamental constants of the universe of physics are too good to be true. They're fine-tuned. If they were a tiny bit different, the universe wouldn't have the properties it does and stars wouldn't have come into existence if the gravitational constant was wrong, etc. Right. We wouldn't be here. And they inv or some, some physicists invoke God to explain the fine-tuning of the universe. That's more than just a prime mover. That's a designer, isn't it? That's somebody that who actually that's twiddled the knobs. Would, yeah. Richard, we're going a little bit afield here, but I think it's a good way to go afield. Um, this is, to me, the great god of the gaps. Right. That is, what, what is called the anthropic principle is what we're talking about, right? I don't think it's either a principle. Well, it's anthropic. What we do as scientists, we observe that the universe is made in this way. And if we changed any one of a series of 20 constants, you know, the, the Planck constant, the velocity of light, the mass of the proton, the mass, if we changed any one of those by a little amount, we wouldn't be here. And that's scientifically um, acceptable, you know, that we would not be here unless all these constants had the value they had and the laws of nature were the way they were. If the mass of the proton to the mass of the electron differed by just a little bit, 
we would not be here because the sun, okay, would not have lived long enough for life to have originated on a planet like the Earth. There are all kinds of these arguments. How does a scientist confront them? To me, it's a scientific problem, it's a scientific observation that does not yet have a scientific answer. But to bring in God to explain this, to me, is the great God of the gaps. Because first of all, why do you bring in God? This is a scientific issue, okay? God has no place in trying to resolve this, honestly. And if you bring him in, again, we get back to the intelligent design movement. You bring in a God who kind of at the beginning was making a big bowl of soup, the world. And he tuned it all up. He put a little salt and a little pepper. He added a little celery to make it just right so that human beings would come to be. That, to me, is, is a real absurdity to imagine a creator that would have kind of fine-tuned the universe in that way. I just don't accept that from either a religious or a scientific point of view. One of the explanations is this multi-universe theory. But again, you get into all kinds of um, methodological considerations there. But it's being proposed more and more seriously, you know, that the explanation is there are many, if not an infinite number. This um, idea that, you know, everything is fine-tuned so that human beings would come to be does not have a scientific explanation. It hangs there as an issue that we try to resolve. One suggestion is this multiverse, that is, that there are many universes. And one can imagine how this happened from the Big Bang there was an inflationary period where little pockets expanded at greater than the velocity of light because there was no matter, so the space-time framework could expand greater than the velocity of light. And as it did, then it braked. And so we have these many pockets that we call universes. So the whole thing is a multiverse. And now you can imagine that there are a large number, if not an infinite number, and that's imaginable, whether it's scientifically verifiable is another point. And so in each one of these universes, you have a different series of constants. It's like rolling the balls around in a lottery. You come up with a different series of numbers each time. But if you do enough of them, then you come up with the series of numbers that we have in our universe. Unfortunately. We have to be in one of those universes we have that's to capable be there, of giving rise to us. That's, yes. that's correct. We, yes. it's, that, that's sort of a tautology that we have to be there. My problem with that, but, you know, this is, <clears throat> it's, it's more a, a concern about methodology. Since these universes were created, or came to be in this inflationary multiverse, they are further away from one another than light can travel in the whole age of our universe. That is, we cannot communicate. So we can know nothing any. about them. So that's not verifiable yeah. or falsifiable to yeah. follow the mm -hmm. tradition of falsifiability. Therefore, it's not science to me. Yes. But there are some people who are, including some eminent scientists, not George Ellis, Martin Rees, mm. people like this are discussing this multiverse theory yes. in a very serious scientific way. So who am well, I to... I've been extremely interested in hearing all that you've said, and, and I, I agree with so much of it. Uh, it sounds as though you don't want to use any kind of uh, scientific uh, 